Hello, welcome again to another uh, video financial uh, podcast, and it's a great series here. We're going to be looking at a company called Chemring Group today. Uh, first one in the podcast series that we've looked at in this industry space. Uh, so Chemring essentially provide uh, technology products and services geared towards the aerospace defense and the securities industries. So think about things like um, the you know, sensors, uh, right? So they develop. We're looking at this company because one of our viewers has requested this. And if you're a fan of our show, you will know that uh, when you make a request, uh, if their information is public and we can access it, then we are more than happy to oblige. So uh, Harkarat, uh, China, thank you for your request. Uh, and we also looked at the second company that requested and we'll put the post or the link to that video up soon. Um, stick around because we found something slightly unusual that you would expect to find in the financial statement that we didn't for this company. But just to make one point here, for all those watching this video, uh, Ted and I, uh, are looking at just the fundamental analysis of the financial statement of this company. Now, when you're looking at whether you want to invest in this business or whether you want to uh, do business with them and you're looking about approaching about to them from a sales perspective, uh, one point to note here that's very important is that this is one part of a series of things that you're going to be doing research on. So we're not going to be covering other elements that are important in this short 15, 10 to 15 minute video. We encourage you to look at those other elements if you're going to be making any sorts of investment. This video is just about our opinions based upon the financial statement itself and a snapshot at best of that financial statement. So Ted, uh, take it away. Really interested to share with our viewers what we found about this company. Uh, yeah, well, good to see you, Moeed, and thank you very much for that introduction. So, yeah, here we go. Here is Chemring, um, and these are their annual accounts. Um, nice, glossy uh, pictures, um, uh, very kind of colourful, and they are available on their website. So if you are looking to invest in this company, you might want to have a look through the strategic report and through the governance. But we are interested in the financial statements. So this is on page 105 and onwards. So let's go down to 105. So here we are on page 105, uh, looking at the income statement. And uh, just remember that this is fundamental analysis. This is just looking at the numbers. We haven't looked at whether they've signed a new contract, whether they've kind of got into a new space, whether there's been a change of management, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So first thing we notice here is we are looking at this column, this right hand column here, um, this is the total. You'll notice that there's this, what they talk about is the underlying performance. They're trying to say, look, this is the core business. Uh, and then there are sort of some other things going on, sort of what we call non-underlying items. And you'll notice that they put them in last year and they basically said, look, you know, this is a kind of a one-off hit. You're not going to see it. You didn't see it last year. You're not going to see it this year. And therefore, what you should really be doing is looking at the core performance of the business which in our example makes a 42 and a half million um, pound profit um, however uh, those of you who are very observant will notice that the non-underlying items that happened last year there's a whole lot of more non-underlying items that happened this year and I can bet your bottom dollar there will be some more non-underlying items happening next year as well. So uh, as a general rule I ignore the non-underlying items because non-underlying items are basically part and parcel of doing business. So we are interested in this, num uh, this column here and what we notice up at the top is, first of all, is that they give us the revenue, that's the sales of 402 million, uh, 402 and a half million pounds, and the operating profit of 46.3 million pounds. Now, if you want to uh, uh, do a little um, uh, a calculation, uh, then that means that their operating margin is 12%. So for every one pound they sell, it's costing them 88p to make the service or to provide that service. And the other, um, the rest of it uh, uh, goes uh, on actually um, uh, the, the other 12p they get to keep, so to speak. 
Now, uh, that means that you can actually work out what is the, um, the operating cost. But what's interesting is in between here, traditionally, we tend to see cost of sales equals gross profit. And then we deduct the cost of running the business, the sales, the general, the administrative, the overheads they're sometimes referred to in getting to the operating profit. So what this company is not doing is giving us a breakdown between the cost of sales. That's the cost of the thing that they're selling, whether it's a product or a service versus the cost of running the business such as the hr team the finance team rent rate light heat travel expenses hr and the, and the kind of the uh, board of directors etc etc now traditionally companies that don't provide that uh, that breakdown are very fixed cost businesses so if we think about someone like edf energy for example or um, uh, you know, a, a telco network operator. So a telco network operator, they've got to run the network. They run the network whether everybody's using it or whether nobody is using it. So it tends to be a fixed cost business and therefore they tend not to make this distinction between cost of sales and the cost of running the business because they need to run the business to make the sales, so to speak. OK, but if you think about a supermarket, that's much more of a, you know, they're selling the fruit and veg versus the cost of actually running that actual store, for example. So what this suggests is that it's what's called a high operational gearing model. Now, I'm not convinced by that. I think there is a cost of sales. For, so for some reason, they've decided not to show us. But anyway, they are making an operating profit. There it is. It's 46 point uh, three million pounds, a 12 uh, percent uh, 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 operating margin uh, on the previous year they were making a nine percent uh, uh, margin so that has definitely um, uh, increased um, we can see there's a little bit of finance expense if they've got a bit of finance expense then it means they've got a little bit of debt sitting on the balance sheet but it doesn't look like um, that is unaffordable so just comparing uh, the interest to the operating profit looks like it's fine they're paying a little bit of tax and they are making a bottom line profit um, so Reasonable bottom line profit, 9% net margin compared with 7% in the previous year. So, um, you know, again, I don't know the, the industry that well, um, but that would look, you know, not unreasonable. So, you know, reasonably um, a, a lowish margin. So it's a competitive environment, but not too low. We're not in sort of supermarket territory. So income statement everything looks absolutely fine let's go and have a look at their balance sheet and see the strength of the business that sits behind that income statement so here is their balance sheet um so what do we got up here so the first thing we notice is the top half of the balance sheet here this is the non-current assets these are the things they need to run the business um you'll notice that there's some goodwill um, uh, very uh, well exactly the same as the previous year as well and this means that effectively they have grown by buying other businesses it's not a massive number 100 million um, but they have grown you know it's not pure organic growth for this company they have grown by buying other companies and we see that the biggest number is this property plant and equipment so this is a kind of they're making stuff uh, and they're using property plant and equipment to make it um, 194 million pounds up from 170 which means that they are certainly investing in the future of the business and it also suggests to me that there must be a cost of sales if they are making stuff anyway so they've got quite a lot of uh, non-current assets much bigger than their current assets which is this number here um, and their current assets you'll notice there's the inventory the stock so this is what they're selling. So again, lending, uh, uh, giving rise to the fact that there is probably some form of cost of sales. They've got their trade and other receivables and they have got a, a reasonable amount of cash. Cash has gone up significantly and they're on about 15, just under 15 million pounds worth of cash. We'll also notice that the stock, uh, the inventories has increased and the, um, the, uh, uh, the trade and other receivables has also increased. So it's worth bearing in mind that on the income statement, sales were up by 20%. And if we run the figures here, we've seen an increase in stock by 17%. That doesn't appear unreasonable. If your sales are going up by 20%, maybe your stocks will go up by 20%. Um, and there has also been a fairly big increase in their trade and other receivables. Now, that's not shown on the face of it. We'd actually have to go and look at the notes to find out exactly what's going on in here. 
So let's go and have a quick look at note 16 uh, to get a breakdown of this, uh, this 62.8 million pounds. So here we are looking at the notes. Uh, so the first thing we notice is inventory. So they are definitely manufacturing. There they are. So the raw materials, um, they've got 50 million quid's worth of raw materials, 25 million of work in progress, and another 15 million of finished goods. Uh, I'm guessing that they are kind of, you know, in the defense industry, they're probably making to order. So people put in an order and then they produce the finished goods, ship them out. So 91 million up from 78 million. That's an increase of 17 percent, um, you know, reasonable. And we can notice here that there's a little bit of a write down uh, in the um, inventories. So, uh, you know, they're, they're very much forefront, cutting edge technology. So some of the older stuff will go out of date and they've got to get rid of it. Um, here's their trade and other receivables, um, and we see the um, uh, the big number here. So this is the um, the, the actual trade and other so the trade receivables from their customers. It's up from 30 million at the end of 2019 to 46 million. Now that's quite interesting because that is a 51 percent increase. So it's gone up by almost you know basically 50 percent, um, which is quite high compared with the um, with the increase in sales. Now, not unreasonable, uh, defense industry, they're going to be big, big contracts. Um, and there's going to be a little bit of timing difference in some times of uh, when they're actually going to receive some of these sales. So just something to flag, but not necessary to lose, um, lose our shirt over. Okay, let's go back to the, um, the, uh, uh, the balance sheet. And if we look at the bottom half of the balance sheet, so here we are looking at the, uh, the, the liabilities. So these are the current liabilities, the things we have to pay soon. And uh, down here, we've got the non-current liabilities, the things that we have to pay next year, the year after the year after that. Um, so looking at this balance sheet, the first thing we notice is that the current assets, if you remember, were 170 million. Current liabilities are 111 million, so liquidity does not appear to be a major problem. Um, the big number that does jump out at us as is this number here, this trade and other payables up significantly from the previous year, 68 million up to 90, uh, 97, nearly 98 million. And again, a little bit more information given to us in note 20. So let's go and have a look at note 20 and see what it tells us about trade and other payables. So here is note 20. And what's quite interesting here is looking at the trade payables. So the trade payables have increased from 67 to 19.9. Now, 19.9 doesn't look that big. However, what does stand out to me is this line here, okay? And this is other payables. Now, we don't know what other payables are, but we can have a guess. So this is uh, often used by companies uh, as an early payment scheme. So uh, uh, what you find is that companies like Chemring, they're buying from their suppliers, their suppliers send them the invoice. The invoice says, um, you know, pay me in 30 days time, but if you want a 5% discount, you can pay me within the next three days, for example. What happens is that Chemring then pass these on to a bank, the bank pays them immediately, um, uh, and gives the money to Chemring, and then the bank effectively um, uh, uh, pays the invoice a little bit later and charges Chemring a small percentage charge. This is what um, a green sill finance was, was involved with. So these are known as early payment systems and is a form of hiding uh, your, supplier, um, uh, your supplier debt. So whenever I see something like that, a big number that says other payables uh, without any explanation as to what those other payables are, I get a little bit nervous. And what I might want to do um, as a result is uh, when I'm looking at my accounts receivable and accounts payable, I might want to actually include uh, those numbers, um, uh, you know, those two numbers together. Uh, and we see that actually if we take the two numbers together, so if we take um, uh, uh, these two numbers together uh, as this year, these two numbers together as last year, we see a 50% increase in trade payables. So... <coughs> Sales gone up by 20%, inventory gone up by 20%, kind of makes sense. 
uh, our accounts receivable gone up by 50% and our accounts payable have also gone up by 50%. Now, again, this may be timing differences or it may be that they're sitting there and saying, if our customers don't pay us, we can't afford to pay our suppliers or our finances, for example. So, you know, just, just something to be aware of, but nothing really that's going to give me sleepless nights uh, uh, right now, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, back to the balance sheet and, and, and see what else is going on there. Um, so what we can see, so from this year to last year, so the current borrowings, what we notice here, they had about 70 million of current borrowings, which they have to give back soon, which are no longer there. So it looks to me like they've repaid this borrowing. So they had a debt, they had to give it back pretty soon, and they have given that money back. Uh, you know, there it is. However, if we look in the non-current liabilities, you notice that they had very low non-current liabilities and they have increased substantially. So this looks to me like there's an element of refinancing going on. Effectively, they have borrowed long term to repay the short term debt. That's effectively what's going on there. And we'll be able to confirm that when we look at the cash flow statement. Finally, at the bottom, looking at the equity. Um, so this is a profitable business, which is good. Um, we can see these top lines are talking about how they've raised the money. So this is still a kind of a lot of uh, uh, money being raised. Um, 2.8 million plus uh, 306, 307, about 310 million of, sh uh, of actual sort of physical shareholders um, cash being put in. Um, they haven't done any fundraising in the year because these two numbers are, are staying the same. Um, and down here, the retained earnings, it looks to me like they're finally, you know, they're making a profit now. Um, and that profit, you know, some of that profit certainly is being retained in the business. Although uh, 8.5 to 28 uh, means that there's an only increase of 20 million uh, and they made a, whatever it was, a 42, um, uh, th sorry, 34.7 million profit. So it means that they must have been paying out some dividends. And we can confirm that by looking at the movement in shareholders' equity, which is here. Uh, and so if we look at the uh, movement in shareholders' equity, here it is. So for this year, they start with 8.5 million of retained earnings. That was what I was just showing you in the balance sheet on the right-hand column. There's the 28 that they finish with. There is the profit that they make during the year coming in from the profit and loss account. And as I surmised, uh, they are paying out a dividend. Now, uh, this is uh, comparing this number here to this number here is what's known as the dividend cover. And it's basically saying they're paying out 33% of profits as a dividend and the rest is being reinvested back into the business. And there's a little bit of share based payments going on and some other bits and pieces, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that looks pretty reasonable. If you're a company, you're a growing company, uh, you know, you, you know, you've taken a lot of investment, you're starting now to make profits, you're starting to kind of, you know, to, to reward your shareholders for sticking with you. Uh, and that's where the dividends are coming from. So last statement to look at is the cash flow statement. Um, so what we are interested in is, uh, first of all, the net cash flow from operating activities. Um, so that is this number here. Um, and so we've got the so the net cash flow from operating activities um, uh, is showing the uh, 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 you know that they are generating cash. They were generating cash last year. They're generating cash this year. Uh, it's increased, which is fantastic. Um, so that's uh, that's a sort of good news. Um, you'll notice up here that they've given me the the cash from operating uh, activities, um, and this will be after the um, uh, the movement in things like. The, uh, uh, the working capital. So it's sometimes it's worth having a look at that. So lots of companies will actually give me the kind of the, uh, the operating profit or a profit figure from the profit and loss account and work me through in the top of the cash flow statement through to the net cash flow from the operating activities, which is this number here. But I'd like to go and have a look at note 31 just to see how they've arrived at that 82 uh, million in cash. You remember they're only making an, an operating profit um, of something like 46 million. So how could they be making all that cash? We're going to have a look at note 31. So here is note 31, which is taking the operating profit 46.3 million and turning it into a cash profit of 82.4 million. If you remember, that's what I was interested in. And you'll notice that some of the big numbers 
Um, we've got uh, uh, depreciation is being added back in. So they've got a lot of assets so that they, um, they add back depreciation because that's an accounting expense, which is in the profit and loss account, but has no effect on their cash. And you'll notice that also increase in trade payables. If you don't pay your suppliers, then you have more cash. It has a positive effect on your cash balance. Um, and uh, also they have uh, an increase in other receivables, which has a negative effect on their cash balance. But this is quite a big number here. Uh, we just want to keep an eye on that, that they're not uh, showing, they're not trying to show themselves as cash positive because they're not paying their suppliers. That would definitely not be a good idea. So let's go back to our cash flow statement. So looking at the bottom half of the cash flow statement, we now know why they are making this cash flow from operating activities. We might want to discount the effect of some of that sort of accounts payable. That was 25 million, so they're down to 50 million of cash. Um, and don't forget there is a 30, um, a 30 million of depreciation included in that. Um, we can see on this next line, this is the investing going on. So they are they're investing in property, plant and equipment, uh, a pretty healthy degree of investment going on. This is investing for the future. That's good. They seem to be able to afford it. And then down here, we've got the, um, the financing that the, the, this, this part here is the financing of the business. Um, and what we notice here is the drawdown of the borrowings and the repayment of borrowings. So they have borrowed 108, they've repaid 123. If you remember that 123, a lot of that would have gone down to paying down uh, the debt at the end of, um, uh, end of last year, the short-term debt. So there's a lot of refinancing going on here, but on a net basis, they are using some of that surplus cash to pay down their, uh, their financing. And obviously they're also keeping the shareholders happy with a dividend. So the, sum, the summary is that this company, you know, they are generating cash, probably not as much cash as they say they're generating, but that's a little bit of a timing difference there. They are generating cash, they're investing in the future, and some of that uh, extra cash that they're generating, they're using to keep the shareholders happy by paying a dividend. And they are, you know, their, their, their debt is kind of on a net basis is going down. However, the debt doesn't keep them awake at night because they're only paying um, uh, 3 million of interest uh, over 30, uh, 46 million of operating profit. So it's very, very much affordable. So there we have our, our financial analysis of the company. Um, it all seems to be ticking along. Um, nothing to really kind of worry about as far as I can make out. If we look at, at the, um, the share price, here is the share price of the company. Um, it's trading at a PE ratio. So that's 21 times earnings. Um, and, you know, 21 times earnings, you know, doesn't, you know, uh, you know, traditionally that would be expensive. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the S&P is trading on, you know, 30 times, uh, the FTSE is on about 15 times. Um, so these guys are, you know, they're kind of, you know, they're expensive, but they're not massively expensive. And um, we can see uh, their, um, their share performance. So uh, something happened in the global financial crisis in the aftermath, it's gone all the way up. Uh, they've then take a long hit down to 2016. Um, and it looks to me like they've kind of, you know, they've got their act together um, and they are starting to kind of, you know, the, 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 the sales are going in the right direction. The profits are going in the right direction. You know, the cash is going in the right direction. Um, the, uh, you know, the margins are going in the right direction. Um, you know, it, it's you, you're still paying, you know, 800, you know, over 800 million pounds for shareholders equity of 330 million pounds. So it's about 500 million pounds worth of, of goodwill in there, um, which I don't think is, is, you know, totally unreasonable for a company, you know, especially if it's got a really good niche, you know, defense is not going to go away. You know, look at the geopolitical kind of, you know, tensions going on in the world. You know, these guys have got a market going forward as long as they're relevant, as long as they're investing in R&D, as long as they're staying at the front of their game, um, then I can't see any reason why these guys um, shouldn't be, you know, part of a well-diversified portfolio, if I might put it like that, Moeed. Yeah, yeah, very interesting to see. And uh, certainly... Uh, a good example of what to look for when you're dealing with uh, an aerospace and defense business, certainly ones with very big contracts where the timeline for payments are things that you need to consider, especially with the trade and payables as, as we looked out for. Those were the interesting things that I hinted to earlier on in our video. Thank you for sharing that. 
everyone uh, watching this, don't don't forget to uh, like, share, subscribe. And look, if you have a video, or sorry, if you have a company that you would like us to analyze and look at their finances for you, do leave a note in the comment section. We're getting a lot of these. And in fact, I think all of our videos now for the last few weeks have been purely on uh, requests from our viewers. So do join them and be one of them. Your voice will be heard. And uh, until the next video, thank you very much, Ted. Thank you, everyone else. Again, do like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment in the comment section. Bye for now. Absolutely. So good to speak to you, Moeed. And don't forget also, if you know something about this company that we don't, do add it into the comments section. Do you know educate uh, our viewers um, with your view of what's going on in this company, the contracts they're signing, et cetera, et cetera. This is one part of your fundamental analysis. Good to speak to you, Moe. See you on the next video. Good note. Thank you. Take care.